and uh, it, it warrants the kind of effort and the kind of money it takes to pull one of these things off. So for those of you who are thinking of, of helping and uh, getting involved, I think uh, you'll find a lot of good reasons to do that. Um, so the Animal Legal Defense Fund, the group I run, uh, our mission is to protect the lives and advance the interests of animals through the legal system. So naturally all of our work is focused on the law. Uh, that's that's uh, what defines us and makes us different. And uh, so we're probably best known for the litigation, the cases that we file ourselves. Um, we recently had some success in fighting the ag industry on ag gag laws. How many of you are familiar with what an ag gag law is? Virtually everyone. Good, I don't have to explain it. Um, so we were successful in uh, seven states so far have passed ag gag laws, essentially trying to criminalize uh, the exposure of how animals are treated, how workers are treated, uh, and environmental crimes that may be going on. Um, and they've been successful in passing those laws in seven states. So fortunately, a uh, coalition of organizations, many of the same organizations who belong to the uh, Prevent Cruelty California initiative, uh, have fought back additional states and their efforts to pass similar legislation. Uh, but the Animal Legal Defense Fund wanted to challenge the laws that were already in the books. So we've been successful with Utah and Idaho so far. Uh, we just had a favorable ruling last week in our case against the state of Iowa, uh, which means the case will go forward. And uh, we have a lawsuit filed against the state of North Carolina as well. So that's the kind of work that we do. Um, naturally, a lot of our work is focused on farmed animal issues, just because, uh, as probably most of you in this room know, given the number of animals involved and uh, the, the type of cruelty that the animals are subjected to in the industry, um, and the, how long the period of time that they actually suffer the cruelty, uh, it makes sense for us to focus a lot of energy on that. Um, but people don't know, we also have programs. We have a program that's focused on the criminal law as well. So we help, we actually train prosecutors and law enforcement uh, on a national basis in how to bring a cruelty case. So how to file a criminal case. So we assist prosecutors and law enforcement as well when they're filing cases, make sure they have the tools they need, make sure they understand how to file appropriate charges, etc. cetera. Um, we work on legislation, so we help to draft and pass uh, stronger animal protection laws. And uh, we also have program, a program in the law schools where we have uh, student chapters, so law students who have formed chapters of ALDF. We have about 220 student chapters now, which is almost every accredited law, accredited law school in the country. Um, so we're, you know, get them while they're young and, uh, and brainwash them. Um, so, and there's a lot of excitement in the legal world about animal law and animal rights law in particular, um, which is really exciting because uh, <clears throat> I often say, the fundamental problem for animals in our society is that our laws still consider them things, property, as opposed to living sentient beings. Um, and that's a big high hurdle for us as animal advocates because as long as our laws are saying uh, that animals are things, it normalizes a lot of the kinds of things that we see in factory farms and puppy mills and those sorts of things where animals are, you know, if you dissect the word livestock, you get a sense of what that means. Um, we also have, uh, we've developed a program to invite uh, law firms and lawyers to engage in our work, uh, our pro bono program. So we get law firms and lawyers to sign up and do free legal work for us, which helps us do a lot more legal work. We have about 450 law firms across the country signed up to do pro bono work for us and about 2,000 individual attorneys. So that has really helped us uh, do a lot more work than we could possibly accomplish with staff. Um, and I, all of that legal work, um, you know, we have to be very creative about how we bring the animals' cases to court um, because as things, they don't have rights or in legal terms, interests of their own that can be represented. So we have to, our legal team spends a lot of time being very creative about even getting the animal's case in the, into the courtroom. And so I can tell you with all the work that we do that uh, our laws, our legal system, 
has utterly failed farm animals. Um, there are no federal laws that protect animals uh, when they're being raised on farms. Uh, the only federal laws that exist cover transportation to slaughter and then the actual act of slaughter itself where animals are supposed to be rendered uh, insensible to pain, um, which often doesn't happen. Um, so that's another problem is enforcement. But there's really no laws that cover animals when they're being raised for food. At the state level, um, state cruelty laws in many of the states that have large, a large agriculture industry, farm animals have essentially been written out of the cruelty laws. Um, they've made exemptions that essentially allow the agriculture industry to determine what is proper treatment of animals. So it means basically anything goes. So essentially, cruelty laws don't apply. And even in states like California, where farmed animals are covered by the state's cruelty laws, there's virtually no enforcement. Um, so we see essentially that farmed animals are beyond the law um, and they're not protected in the ways that, that most people think that they are and that's, that's a key. Um, you know, the, the industry would like for people to think that, oh, there's, there's a whole bunch of laws and animals are well taken care of and it's just not true. Um, and that's why this ballot initiative is so important. Um, more than 10 billion animals are raised and slaughtered in the U.S. every year. Um, it's, I think it's actually over 11 billion now. Um, so you can imagine the scale of that. Virtually every single one of those animals has been raised in what we typically call factory farms, or as the industry calls them, uh, combined, or sorry, confined animal feeding operations, or CAFOs. That means that these animals have lived their entire lives in intensive confinement. They've been restricted, their movements are restricted, um, conditions that are unimaginably miserable for, for these animals. Um, and that's what we're confronting. We're confronting an industry that has normalized that behavior, um, that our legal system allows to happen. And here we get to thank you very much. Um, here we get to actually challenge that paradigm, which is what's so exciting. How many of you are uh, familiar with uh, gestation crates? I was guessing most of you would be. Um, and battery cages for hens. Okay. So I don't need to go into great detail to describe um, the horrors of these kinds of things. And veal crates, I think, even in uh, amongst people who are not so devoted to animal issues, um, most people are aware of the horrors of, of veal crates. Um, a lot of pe people, yeah. You could go ahead and describe a gestation crate sure. and a battery cage for the people watching online. Perhaps. Oh yes, for people online. Um, so gestation crates are the uh, the cages essentially in which uh, pigs spend virtually their entire lives. Um, so sows are kept in gestation crates almost their entire lives. Uh, the only time they get a respite, and the gestation crate is basically a cage, a metal cage, the size of their body. Um, so they cannot turn around, they cannot lay down properly. Um, obviously they can't engage in any of the behaviors that are normal for pigs that they desire to do. So it is basically a situation where they are living in constant frustration of every desire that they have and unable to move. Um, and battery cages for hens, uh, it's even somewhat worse. Uh, there can be five hens uh, in a cage about this big. Essentially, each hen in a battery cage has about the space to live in as this eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. They can't stretch their wings, they can't scratch, they live in wire cages. Um, and this is life for most of the hens that are providing the eggs that you buy in the store. Um, and veal crates, uh, and, and I should say that uh, veal calves are a byproduct of the dairy industry. Um, I, was, I was probably in my 30s before it dawned on me that actually that cows don't just produce milk uh, all the time. That like any mammal, they actually produce milk when they're pregnant or nursing. Um, so it, it suddenly dawned on me that they have to keep cows pregnant all the time in order to produce milk products. 
So one byproduct of that is, of course, calves. Uh, calves that are born, the female calves, sometimes go back into the dairy industry. Um, some are slaughtered, but the male calves are essentially uh, a byproduct of the dairy industry. Um, the lucky ones get slaughtered almost immediately um, and are producing uh, low quality veal or these other, other kinds of products. The unlucky ones become uh, gourmet veal, uh, which means that they get uh, put in crates, again, where they can barely move. Um, they're fed uh, a weak diet and uh, they're kept from moving so that their muscle tissues become so soft that they provide the gourmet eating experience that is veal. Um, and so these three examples, and there are others of what happens in factory farms and, and CAFOs, um, I use because these are the three types of confinement that this proposition will end. Um, and so we have uh, all the more motivation uh, for passing this. So what the proposition allows um, or provides for, by 2021, all eggs produced and sold in California will have to be cage-free. So there's no ambiguity there. There's no uh, fine lines that the industry is going to try and exploit. Um, by December 2019, veal sold in California may not come from calves locked in crates. And by December 2021, pork sold in California cannot come from operations that are still using uh, gestation crates. So, what that means is if we pass this ballot measure, California's farmed animal protection laws will be the strongest in the world. Nowhere else will have laws that, that provide that much freedom for farmed animals. Um, would we wish for even more? Absolutely. Um, but that's kind of the give and take of figuring out like what we can do um, and what's, what we can actually pass. So, uh, I should add, there's even more good news from this ballot measure because not only, and I mentioned this, not only will it ban these practices for animals that are raised in California, but it bans it for any products coming in, which means even though this is a California ballot initiative, it really has national implications. Um, and we've seen California take a leadership role in so many ways you know, uh, fuel economy standards where California has placed a higher bar, which has forced the entire automotive industry to up their game in terms of uh, emission standards for cars because it's such a huge market. We have the opportunity to play that card uh, for farmed animals as well. Um, there's also another provision which is um, very exciting for lawyers, uh, and that is that uh, it will allow for some civil enforcement of the law, which means that we don't have to just rely on state regulators or state enforcement agencies to enforce the law. Uh, violators can be sued uh, by other, other entities, um, and this basically makes it automatic. If you violate this law, you are violating um, uh, business and professions codes. Uh, the Animal Legal Defense Fund has already filed multiple cases under California Business and Professions Code, which is basically like unfair competition types of cases that reference the state cruelty laws. Um, so this would actually provide an automatic way for, for this law to be enforced by entities other than state agencies. Um, so that's huge. It means basically that this law has, has teeth, unlike so many laws, like the cruelty laws that don't often don't go enforced. Um, I guess um, if I were to, to try and motivate people um, as to the reasons why you should go out and gather signatures and help us get this ballot measure um, on, it's, you know, we'll do all those good things, of course. And one really, really exciting fact is because these things are uh, you know, it goes from ballot measures go from an idea, how can we change the law, to drafting, uh, what would that law look like, to, you know, vetting, making sure that it will do what we think it will do, um, to polling that says, can we pass this thing? Um, we've been through those stages, uh, and the polling is amazing. You know, Prop 2, which passed in 2008, which this will um, amend and improve, 
uh, was passed by 63% of voters in California. Um, polling right now on this proposition is 72% positive. So basically that means if we get this sucker on the ballot, it will pass. Um, so that's the job that we have to do. Um, and the way we do that is we have to gather 600,000 signatures of California voters by April 20th. Um, and the last count I got, uh, which was as of a couple of days ago, we have about 180,000 signatures gathered so far. So we have a ways to go, um, and we need a lot of help. So not only uh, would I ask that those of you who are not already doing so um, consider going out and gathering signatures yourselves, but tell your friends and refer them to the, the good people here um, who have signature packets and can advise on, on how to get those signatures. Um, and there's a lot of really good advice about techniques for doing that and so forth, so hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about that um, from those of you interested. Equally importantly, so this is, this is the fourth ballot measure campaign I've been involved with. Um, the first one I was involved with was in the mid-90s in Alaska, and it involved uh, trying to end the practice of shooting wolves from airplanes, if you can uh, believe that that was actually a thing we had to end. Um, and from that one and in every one since, I was involved in the trapping initiative that passed in California um, somewhere in the late 90s, I can't remember when, uh, and then Prop 2 in 20, 2008. And I can tell you that of all the things that you know I have done and worked on and so forth, these ballot initiatives are one of the most rewarding. Um, and I can think, I can remember back to moments like this, you know, at the, at the beginning, at the signature gathering phase where the hard work starts and we gotta get this thing on, uh, you know, that energy pushes through, we get it on the ballot, and then I guarantee you, we'll be back in a room like this, uh, or back in rooms like this all across California, and we will be celebrating we will be celebrating the passage of this ballot initiative because we, we, we're going to do this. And there is nothing like that feeling when you know you have like changed the law. You've changed the law and changed the world for really billions of animals who are suffering. There's, there's nothing that we can do as animal advocates that will have this kind of impact. Uh, so, and I want everyone in this room, and I, I, a lot of you I know will be, um, but I want everybody in this room to experience that. I want you to be here when we're having that celebration because it's an amazing feeling. And it will make worthwhile every single minute you spend gathering signatures, standing outside of a Safeway or your, your church or your local uh, community group and gathering those signatures and know that you helped make that happen. It's the best feeling in the world. So um, I want to introduce uh, uh, two people. We've got uh, Zoe and Allie, if you want to raise your hands. Um, and they have signature packets for people who can go out and gather signatures. And they also have, uh, there are some rules you got to follow so, uh, in, in gathering signatures. And they can explain how it's done. But really, um, talk to Zoe and Allie. Get your signature pad. Be a part of this because you will have the most amazing feeling when we get to November and this thing passes and you're part of that celebration and you know what you've done for so many farm animals. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh yeah, that's right. We're doing Q and A. The local elected officials. Um, hmm. What can they do? Can they endorse? Is that a possibility? Yeah, I believe so. I'm trying to remember. So I should say this too. Um, Prevent Cruelty California has a website, of course. It's Prevent Cruelty C A, as in California. dot org. Um, so all the information on uh, who, you know, the, the supporters, the sponsors, so forth. There's a long list of veterinarians and so forth. I can't actually remember if there are uh, politicians, but I believe that there are. They can and, make a section for it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. The more endorsements, the better. Absolutely. Um, yeah. ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes so sense. So thank you. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if our elected um, officials may have a special interest in endorsing because they're coming up for election as well. Just saying. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. Elected officials want to tell their constituents that they were part of this amazing 72%. I mean, come on, if you're a politician, it doesn't get better than that. I had a friend who wanted me to ask if uh, it was the specific language of 2008's proposition um, that I guess you wanted to know if chickens and the hens would be out of cages completely at this point if that had been written more precisely. So um, the answer, the really answer is nobody knows for sure. Um, I mean, not surprisingly, the industry, the egg industry, um, fought back hard. They did not want uh, Prop 8 to, or Prop 2 to pass, um, and they have filed all kinds of lawsuits to try and prevent its in- implementation. So they're definitely, they definitely created a controversy in the law about what exactly complying with Prop 2 meant, um, which got very complicated. And so that's, you know, it's one of the important things. We can, we can wait for those things to play out. Um, there's all kinds of arguments. Um, this proposition will not only clarify those issues and make it absolutely clear that we're talking cage-free, um, but also goes further. Um, so, you know, we're, yeah, it's, you know, I wish, I wish we were there, um, but we fought a lot of legal battles. One thing I'll say is that from uh, the efforts of Prop 2, we've had some of the legal battles that we might have predicted, for example, uh, states that were forced to comply with California's law uh, filed constitutional challenges to California's law, Prop 2, um, claiming that federal law preempted state law and that the uh, initiative could not apply to other states. They lost, but that took us a lot of time. Uh, we had to argue that one in the lower courts and on up through the appeals courts, and that's settled law now, which means we don't have to deal with that with this proposition. So, uh, yeah, it's it's disappointing. We all wish we would get there faster and, and then some, but uh, I think this law fixes a lot of the, the, the questions about um, what came out of Prop 2. Yeah. Um, if somebody wants to start gathering signatures right now for Prevent Cruelty California, what's the fastest way that they can get on board doing that? So anybody here, yeah, talk to Zoe and Allie for sure, get your signature packet, and also get your instructions for how to properly and legally gather signatures, because this is, um, unlike gathering signatures on a petition that just is kind of like saying, I support this concept, uh, you know, we're talking about petitions that actually uh, have legal value and have to be done a certain way. So we're talking only California voters can sign and you have to sign one that's uh, appropriate for your particular county you live in. Um, so there's lots of rules. So definitely talk to Allie and Zoe and uh, get the instructions. And then really you can walk out the door and start, start gathering signatures uh, almost immediately. And I think uh, Zoe and Allie will probably um, be able to talk about like great places to do that. Um, and then you kind of can learn some techniques. For example, uh, I can remember when we were gathering signatures on that Wolf Initiative many years ago, um, we found out that our credibility went through the roof if we had a cute dog with us and people wanted a cute dog. Uh, it was really easy to get the signatures then. So, um, children work the same way, cute little kids, you know. You know. Um, exploit the kids for the animals. Uh, so, um, he didn't mean that. Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, there's there's all kinds of like techniques on how you know how you can really get those signatures. Um, but first thing is is get the packet and the rules and that sort of thing. So, yeah, and for, for people online, oh sorry, people online, how can they get a packet? As quickly as That's a good question, uh, Zoe. Signers PreventCruelTCA.com, which is the website for the initiative, and all the information is there. Um, so you can find out how to get your signature packet and sign up and get the emails. I get the emails from uh, the people running the site. Um, Thank you. You had a question? Another campaign that uh, and the Legal Defense Fund and a lot of other groups worked on was to uh, modify the rules for captive whales and captive cetaceans in California. <laughs> And there was two things. There was the legal part of it, but then fashion changed. People didn't want to do sea animals do tricks anymore. 
do you see the same thing here that fashion is changing about what people want to eat, what connotations they want with their food, and could you elaborate on, on that? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, yeah, the, the SeaWorld controversy and, of course, the, the documentary Blackfish, um, you know, really captured a moment in time where it seems like people's attitudes about keeping animals in captivity, wild animals in captivity, um, much like factory farming in, in you know, conditions that thwart their every natural instinct for entertainment is no longer acceptable. And we saw that with you know, what happened with SeaWorld, uh, we saw it with what happened with Ringling uh, that had to end its use of elephants. Um, there's definitely been a sea change, I think, in people's attitudes in that arena. And I think the same is true. I mean, if you just look at the success of uh, you know, vegan food products in the marketplace, um, you know, there is a sea change happening. And it's, and it's interesting because the, the, even the meat producing industries, which are you know, absolutely uh, you know, view this as a threat to their interest in many ways, are starting to get on board um, because it becomes eventually it becomes a simple matter of economics. They don't want to get left behind when people's uh, attitudes and values are changing in a way about how animals are treated, and when there's amazing products that don't uh, that aren't produced with the kind of suffering that we see typically in, in farms. Um, they want a piece of that action too. I, I, I thought a watershed moment was uh, when Tyson Foods. Uh, which you know uh, slaughters uh, I, I have no idea how many but uh, probably billions of chickens um, every year uh, actually invested in the company called Beyond Meat which is making uh, vegan meat alternatives um, that's huge because they're not doing it out of the goodness of their cold cold <laughs> corporate hearts uh, <laughs> they're doing it because they see that uh, you know trends are changing changing and that uh, people are going to start buying those products and they want a piece of the action. So, and that's great. That's great for animals. Yeah, in fact, actually, they didn't, recently they just said they don't, was it, they, they don't want to work with the disruptors. They want to be the disruptor. That's right. I yeah. mean, that's great quote. significant uh, yeah. for, you know, for a company that's been making a, a lot of money off of chickens. So it, just to clarify, because I think what's so significant about this particular ballot initiative is that it is not just about what is being done to animals in California. It is, and this is so significant, it is any product that would be sold in California that came from animals raised elsewhere who were raised in any of these situations, field crates, yeah. cattle cages, and gestation crates. That's significant. It's and amazing. what are the penalties for, I mean, and how? How do, you, how do you even enforce that, and what are the penalties? I'm, it's just low level. Um, see if I can remember, I think the penalties are, uh, if I remember right, it's it's $1,000 per incident, which could get to be significant mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about you know how many incidents is likely to be if, if companies are selling large volumes of products. Um, it's certainly not to be a serious disincentive. Um, and here's the thing, I would say, you know, this isn't, this is calling on the industry to change the way it's doing things because, I mean, ultimately, passing a law like this, and again, we pull this off, uh, like Colleen said, I mean, this, this has effects that are national in scale, but we're really just creating a level playing field. You know, we're saying, like, you know, everybody, if everybody has to do the same thing, if everybody has to go cage free to compete, then it's a level playing field, you know, and the way we hold companies accountable is through, like I said, there are options to actually file lawsuits under business and professions codes, unfair competition laws, um, where companies can sue other companies, which would be a big deal. I mean, if you're a company, and we've been involved in many cases like that, we've done uh, unfair business practices lawsuits, and we've done false advertising lawsuits against companies that are advertising, you know, using words like humane, and uh, or even pictures on cartons that show, uh, you know, reality, things that are not true. Um, companies have a huge incentive to do that. Because if you're a company and you're actually doing cage-free mm -hmm. and following the law, and there's another company that isn't, but they're saying that they are, they're gonna be undercutting you. So there's a real incentive for businesses actually to enforce the law. But also, I mean, you know, ALDF has filed multiple cases under California's Business and Professions Code. Other groups could probably find the same standing. We've established it. Um, so there will be options for oops, for animal advocate groups like us uh, to be able to enforce the law as well, which is huge. Again, we don't have to be like with the cruelty laws, this is the problem. 
were completely reliant on public prosecutors to actually file charges, which they are so often unwilling to do for farmed animals. We don't have to wait for that kind of thing with this. How will the producers um, prove that they are complying, especially out of state, and how will you use evidence if they aren't? So I don't know what the structure will be. Um, Certainly, I can say that there are a lot of animal uh, advocacy groups that will be making sure they're held accountable and groups that do investigations uh, uh, can certainly be looking for how conditions are. Um, but there's a pretty strong incentive, you know, given the, the penalties for violating the law or not being able to market you know, products in California. Um, that's a pretty huge incentive for companies to, but we expect there will be outliers. Um, just like uh, when you know California, California uh, banned foie gras um, sales in the state, and we've seen companies flout the law, and we're waiting for a final decision, and then we'll be able to hold you know the companies accountable that are still selling foie gras. Um, I think similarly it will happen. We'll certainly find those that are trying to flout the law. Um, how we do that, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I certainly know there are a lot of animal advocacy groups that will be looking for those opportunities, and we would, I mean, we like nothing better than to sue animal abusers. So, you know, if we, if we get the facts and we find out that uh, there are companies that aren't following the rules, um, we will certainly take them to court. Um, and, uh, but I really think, by and large, the industry will be pretty incentivized, and again, you know, this isn't penalizing specific companies. It's it's a level playing field. You know, everybody everybody has to play by the same rules. So they will grouse. They don't want to change. They're happy cramming five hens into a little, you know, cage. Um, they can't do that anymore. It's that simple. Um, and but all their competitors can't do it either. Uh, so there's no financial advantage uh, involved. Wait, in a dream. Uh, on the back of our clip, first of all, we're gathering two images. Like, hey, there's two different images we use. One is animals in cages. The other is the happy-looking pig. What's the importance of imagery? And I know you're from a legal point of view, but like from a marketer's or, or just from a communication point of view, uh, are hard images useful? Or, are happy images useful? In blackfish, they have some pretty hard images. Um, but there's a limit as to how much that can be done. Um, we want to show people what is really happening with animals. <coughs> People can only take so much reality sometimes, or perhaps they can take it in doses. Do you have any thoughts on that subject? Um, personally, yes. Um, well, here, okay, here's a perspective. So the question, if people couldn't hear it, was um, whether, you know, the, the use of imagery to promote the, the initiative, whether showing animals in horrible conditions or actually showing happy animals, like the, the alternative or animals that are not in cages, um, is more effective. I mean, it's something that, that we run into in terms of, you know, if we post something on the web or if we send a mailing out to our members and it shows an animal that's, you know, in distress somehow or injured, say, in a cruelty case, um, we get a lot of negative feedback when that happens. Um, on the other hand, it often generates more interest, more involvement, more people take action. Um, so it's kind of a balancing act. I mean, you don't want to beat people over the head. And frankly, you know, some of your best animal advocates um, people like you, a lot of you in this room who are doing this kind of stuff, you don't really need to see gruesome images all the time. And in fact, you know, for some people it can be pretty, fairly demoralizing um, because we already know how these things go. But in terms of reaching the, the public at large, I think one of the big things we're facing is ignorance. You know, I think people still do buy into the old McDonald's farm myth and, you know, the red barn and the green field and animals running around in the sunshine. Um, and so when we, we talk about, those of us who, who know about this stuff and you know, live and breathe these issues, we know what's going on for real, but a lot of people don't. So I think that's, you know, I'm, you know, graphic arts is not my specialty, so, um, but I do think, you know, I see people react to those kinds of things sometimes and just in like, oh my God, you know, I had no idea this is how animals are treated. I mean, to see a pig in a gestation crate <laughs> To see a hen in, you know, a battery cage crammed in with five other birds where most of their feathers are gone, sometimes one of the birds is dead and they're still having to live in there with, with the corpse, you can no longer claim innocence if you see that, right? It's so, 
Um, I think that's the thinking. But of course, we also want to be aspirational. Say, you know. So Stephen, we have time for probably just one more question. But before we get there, I want to uh, just introduce and recognize uh, Council Member uh, Dan Chow from uh, Oakland. Thanks, Dan. Excellent. Well, if you want to gather signatures, I'm sure we could set you up too. Yeah. <laughs> One more? Sure. What can you tell us about the genesis of the campaign? Like, who put it together? Who drafted the language? Who was sort of first on board? Yeah, so the Humane Society of the United States was definitely the initiator of the campaign. Um, and did most of the background work is providing a lot of the funding, uh, the bulk of the funding. Um, other groups that have signed on have provided quite a bit of funding and resources, uh, in some cases office space volunteers, office space volunteers, those sorts of things, but um, it definitely initiated with the Humane Society. Can I ask one real quick? Sure. So didn't Massachusetts in 2016 pass um, a Farm and Animal Act also? And that one, like this one, um, prevented uh, out-of-state products from coming in that were not raised to their standards. Um, and if that's the case, is there been has it been in um, existence long enough to have seen sort of any problems or or any benefits to that law passed? It's a great question, and and I actually don't know um, if they have had any. Um, I mean, it's really new, so the Massachusetts yeah. initiative just passed a year ago. Um, so I'd imagine they're probably still just in implementation phase, and I don't know even, you know, typically there's a phase in period, much as it's disappointing for all of us to have to, you know, do this thing and then have to wait for implementation. Um, it is addressing the reality that it would be, unreal, uh, be unrealistic to assume that the industry could move to cage-free overnight. Um, and I think that's where Massachusetts is right now, is just like getting the implementation started. Um, so I haven't heard anything. I haven't heard about any challenges to Massachusetts initiative at this point, but. Yeah, I haven't either. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, having done Prop 2 and having faced one of the big hurdles, which was a challenge to the constitutionality of a state, any state, uh, passing a law, you know, this kind um, that affected other states. Uh, one of the big arguments that the industry wanted to make was that you can't do that because federal law preempts state law on these interstate commerce issues. That was struck down. So that's going to benefit Mass Massachusetts as well. They won't have to deal with that particular argument, um, likely, because it's settled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's idea. powerful. It's the moment yeah. of it's the moment of not. I mean, there's this little gap you have between between exposing someone and then and not losing them. So, so kind of bridging that when you're communicating with them. And I think a lot of that has to do with empathy and our empathic response to their desire for cognitive dissonance, even while they're looking at it. So I love that it's on the back of your clipboard because literally, I mean, you know, it can be quick and you can be and 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 if this is disturbing and we're so and we're all so disturbed by this and yet we can do something about it. So as quickly as they see it to provide a solution for them. Oh, yeah. The yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Exactly. I think that it can That's be really a great powerful. Point. But to yeah. just bring them in, literally kind of envelop them with your own empathy for it, um, I think that makes a huge difference for people's responding to it. Yeah, yeah, it's a really great point. You're not just clobbering someone over the head with a gruesome image, you're saying we have an opportunity exactly. to fix this. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Stephen, and please, everyone, um, please see the <laughs> lead and Allie. reiterate that Councilman Kalb was uh, instrumental in passing the Bullhook ban in Oakland and that really was the, the entire um, 
ripple effect of, of, of Ringling taking elephants out of circuses and then them going, I oh, guess this isn't gonna work, we just have to close all together all the animal acts. So um, we're so proud of Councilman Calvin, everybody who was part of that. And, uh, and hopefully... <laughs> It's so powerful. I mean, Oakland really is uh, is a leader in this area. I always love to tell the story that Jack London was uh, so opposed to uh, animal uh, performances in circuses, and so a hundred years later, for us to have been part of Ringman closing is so exciting. And now we're looking to close the gap so no other circuses, animal circuses, can come in and take the place of Ringling. So we're looking to work with Councilman Cal Calv to um, to ban all exotic and animal performing acts in Oakland all together. So we're very excited for that and for supporting them. Um, Councilman Calvin, so again, please uh, become a member of the East Bay Animal Pack. It's only $50 to become a member for the year. You can help us vote and support uh, support elected officials like Councilman Cap and all of their animal-friendly legislation. So thanks everyone for coming tonight. Please eat food, <laughs> the cake pops, and uh, get more information to get your signature packet. So thanks everybody.